I am so excited. I am incredibly honored to receive an honorary doctorate from the University of Toronto, especially in the year celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Department of Computer Science. And it's especially meaningful for me to have Derek Corneal, Professor Corneal, be the person who hooded me. Because as you'll hear as I tell you about my path into computer science, Derek was really the person who made it all possible. And um, I have received some other honorary doctorates, but this one is a very, very special one for me. Like everyone who is graduating today, my time as a student at the U of T had a huge impact on my life. But my relationship with the university starts even earlier. During the Second World War, my parents moved from Britain to Toronto and taught here as adjunct faculty, my father in applied physics and my mother in economics. I was born in the Toronto General Hospital in 1951, so I'm going to be 64. That's a great number for computer scientists this summer. <laughs> But after some time in Ottawa and then Edinburgh, we ended up in Edmonton, where both of my parents were professors at the U of A. It's really nice being back in Canada, so I don't have to say the University of Alberta. You actually know that U of A is not the University of Arizona. <laughs> Growing up, I took it for granted that I would become a professor in something at a Canadian university. I mean, after all, my parents were professors, and what else would you do? After falling in love with math, I thought I knew what the something would be. Math, of course. Reality struck when I started applying for jobs as a math professor towards the end of my PhD at the University of Alberta. There were 83 faculty positions available for pure mathematicians across all of the United States and Canada. I applied for every single one. I've applied to places you really have never heard of. There are about 1,000 people applying for those 83 jobs. And you know, many of those jobs were actually not tenure track permanent faculty positions. They were visiting positions or lecturer positions for maybe one or two years. So I felt incredibly lucky to land one of the permanent positions in Oakland University in Michigan. And Oakland University is part of the university of uh, the State University System of Michigan, and it's about 25 miles north of Detroit. Within a month or two at Oakland, I wasn't feeling so lucky. In fact, I was desperately looking to escape back to Canada. Mostly the problem was a combination of culture shock and loneliness. I was used to living in cities with lots of ethnic restaurants, foreign movies, single people, and Canadians. <laughs> Oakland was in the middle of fields, fast food restaurants, residential suburbs, married people, and Americans. I compensated by attending math conferences. Okay, that sort of tells you something, right? I mean, I really do love math, but you know, you gotta be really lonely to go to a math conference every month. <laughs> At one of those conferences, I discovered there were lots of open faculty positions in computer science departments, and that many people who did the same kind of math as I did held pos positions in computer science departments. The only problem was that I knew nothing about computer science. And this is where Derek Corneal and the University of Toronto comes to the rescue. So I, I had met Derek uh, in my last year. I was doing a, a postdoc for the last year of my PhD at um, UBC. And yes, you don't usually do the postdoc before you get your PhD, but sometimes. And Derek was doing his sabbatical at UBC. And I had sat in on a class that he was teaching in, on graph theory. And, and so when I decided that I was going to try to um, do a second PhD in computer science, I called Derek, because at least I knew him. And, and Derek went, oh, the province of Ontario just changed the rules on what our provincial scholarships, graduate scholarships, could be given to. And they have to go to permanent residence or Canadian. And you're Canadian. That would be great. <laughs> now, what I didn't learn until I actually got here was the department chair, who is the Pat Hume that you heard about together with the story about Kelly Gottlieb, was very opposed to allowing me into the graduate program because he didn't think people should be allowed to get two PhDs. So Derek and Pat had a bet about whether I would finish my PhD at the University of Toronto. And um, as Derek says, you know, Pat was department chair. 
And he won the bet by giving me a faculty position, <laughs> which really seems very unfair. But I think, you know, we now can say that Derek won the bet because I did finally get my PhD. So despite my lack of any undergraduate computer science education, the U of T admitted me to the PhD program. My plan was to do the graduate coursework in the first year and then write my PhD thesis in the second year. I never finished that because, as I said, I got hired. So I give the University of Toronto, and particularly Derek Corneal, but really all of the faculty who taught me while I was here, the credit for making me a computer scientist. But wait, there's more! The U of T found me, my husband, Nick Pippinger, and we will celebrate our 35th wedding anniversary on Sunday. Why don't you give me a, thank you. Why don't you give me a quick introduction to some of the research stars in computer science outside the University of Toronto, because there are those other nine universities in the top 10 computer science departments. <laughs> The department gave me the job of running one of the department's seminars in my first year as a faculty member. And they suggested that I invite Nick to be a speaker, and he turned out to be the second speaker in the series. The rest is history. We were engaged within a few weeks. We were married at the U of T, of course, Hart House, about eight months later. And you know, initially, we had expected that Nick would leave IBM Research. Um, to join me as a computer science faculty member at the University of Toronto. But in the end, we decided I would join Nick at IBM in a new research group in San Jose, California. And we ended up, I, I've always loved being at universities. I love students. I love teaching. I love research. And so, you know, I never thought that we would, I, my plan was we'd stay at IBM Research for three to five years. Well, we actually stayed eight. But since that time, we've spent our careers as computer scientists and mathematicians moving between Canada and the United States with 15 amazing years at UBC, three at Princeton, and now nine at Harvey Mudd College. And I'm just going through reappointment for another five-year term after the second five-year term ends. So I expect to be at Harvey Mudd um, for at least 15 years in total. Much of that time has been devoted to building academic units from research groups to departments to faculties and now a tiny college. Harvey Mudd has 803 students. I know half of them by name. Um, one of the things that Nick and I particularly loved about the computer science department at Toronto was its culture of combining excellence, inclusivity, and support and encouragement for everyone. And I think one of the things that, when, when you have an educational experience where people really care about you and give you support, you learn how important that is. And uh, we have up here on the stage one of my oldest friends, Ed Lazowska, who uh, was the department chair of computer science at the University of Washington, while I was the department head of computer science at UBC. And you know, I would often sort of look at our two departments and say, you could really tell we were both at Toronto because we learned that culture. So everywhere Nick and I have gone, we have tried to recreate the U of T computer science culture in our institutions. Now, I'd like to close by opening some, by offering some advice to our graduates. Um, I'm, try, I'm gonna try and give you some advice that you, know, you might not have gotten from others. Um, so it might sound a little bit weird. So the first one is pursue your passion where there's a need. The second one is fail openly and often. And the third one, it's never too late to learn something difficult. So let me talk about pursuing your passion where there's a need. In, in the United States and in Canada, we quite often tell our children, do what you love and you'll be successful. And that's really flawed advice because what you love, like mathematics for me, might not be in an area where there's actually a need in society at that time. There could be an oversupply of people aiming to work in your area of passion. But if you pay attention to where society needs talent in addition to what you love doing, it's often possible to combine the two. And you know, I've already told you about how I was able to combine my love for math and teaching by moving to computer science. But you know, more than just that, moving to computer science opens so many 
research areas to me that I just never would have thought about, from educational games, human-computer action, assistive technologies, and gender studies, to name just a few. Now, everyone who's graduating today is graduating in computer science in one way or another. And you are incredibly lucky. The reason you're incredibly lucky is you're graduating at a time where there's a huge demand for talent in computer science. And the demand is coming not just from the tech companies or from the universities, it's coming from all areas of society. And one of the things I learned by making the move from math to computer science at a time when there weren't enough computer scientists, that if you graduate at a time when there aren't enough computer scientists, there will never be enough computer scientists of your age when you're looking for positions. So you are very fortunate. I'm, I mean, I know you've really worked hard to get here, because it is hard work. And I can tell you the, the year I did of, of, of graduate courses here, I literally got up at 7 every morning and worked until midnight, seven days a week, for the entire two semesters I was here, and did nothing else. So I'd also like to tell you a little bit about another passion that I have, um, which is painting. I've been a painter since a young child and became addicted to watercolors as a graduate student in mathematics. After my PhD, I kept on painting watercolors but hid it from everyone except my closest friends and family until I turned 40. Okay, you already know I'm gonna be 64, so 40, that was a while ago. I hit it because I thought it was hard enough to be taken seriously as a female researcher in math and computer science without having people know that I was an artist too. I just felt like that would be the death knell. But on my 40th birthday, I came out of the closet, I framed 14 paintings and hung them in my home and office. Now 17 years ago, as the Dean of Science, I started at UBC, I started painting at meetings, board meetings, conferences, workshops, I, and the reason I did this, I, I must admit, I was sort of nervous when I did it, but it was a meeting of the deans of arts and science for Western Canada. There's 60 people. It's not particularly interesting. It's these, the sessions are gonna go on for, you know, like a day and a half. And it was on a weekend, and weekends were my painting time. So I carefully set myself up with my paints and water and my painting block, and you know, the really amazing thing was, um, I found out that when I'm painting, I'm a much better participant in meetings because it keeps me from talking too much. <laughs> it also, often people who are sort of nervous will choose to, you know, who sort of like rock their chair back and forward or, you know, do things like that, twitch. They like to sit beside me because it distracts them. They can watch the painting and they really like it. People started asking for my paintings, so I started giving paintings to people to celebrate achievements, like graduating, or thank for them for contributions to my favorite universities. And this February, I had my first art show in more than a decade in the Community School for Music and Art in Mountain View. And that was really coming out of the closet. Okay, fail openly and often. So I just wanna be really clear about this, I hate failing. It's usually both painful and embarrassing. So why do I give you this advice? The first thing is we all learn more from failure than from success. When you succeed at doing something, you don't force yourself to go back and think about what you could have done better. You just, oh, I rocked. That was great. I killed that, whatever. But failing also means that you're setting high standards for yourself. And there's lots of research that shows that setting high personal standards is probably the biggest predictor of high achievement and success in your career. Now that's why you should be failing often. The reason to fail openly is to show that it's okay to fail and to acknowledge that people make mistakes and learn from them. Because this creates an environment where people can aim high and take risks. And both are important for encouraging learning and achievement. Okay, my last piece of advice is never too late to learn something difficult. You're probably wondering why I would tell you this when you're, you've just completed an intense period of learning. And you know, even though most of you are not going to be 64 this summer, perhaps none of you are gonna be 64 this summer, 
it's still true that even at your age, there are things that people will tell you you're too old to learn something and be really good at it. So for example, if you didn't start playing a musical instrument as a child, or if you didn't start learning a language as a child, or if you didn't love math in high school, people will often say, well, you're not going to be any good at abstract math. Well, most people are wrong. If there's something you're interested in learning, it's never too late. It might take you longer than people who started at a younger age. <coughs> Nine years ago, I decided to learn to ride a skateboard. There are skateboards. Yes, it's true. I don't think I've actually worn one in one of these gowns, ridden one in one of these gowns. But <coughs> there are skateboards everywhere at Harvey Mudd College, also unicycles, freeliners, and other wheel devices. I'd always wanted to be able to ride a skateboard. Unfortunately, my coordination is really, it's, I suck at pretty much anything that requires balance and coordination. <coughs> now, at MUD, most students have never ridden a skateboard before they arrive, but within two weeks, they're riding up and down the campus and enjoying it like crazy. Thank you so much. And after <coughs> my first four years of doing this, I'd just gotten, about gotten to the two-week proficiency stage of our students. Learning has had so many benefits. My balance has improved. Better still, even the shyest students like to talk to me when I'm out on my skateboard. Apparently, I look like such a klutz that I become completely non-threatening to them. <laughs> and yes, I wear a helmet and what seems like about a dozen pads, knees, elbows, wrists, tailbones, hip bones. So the important thing about learning something you find particularly challenging is that it helps you become <coughs> excuse me, a much better learner and teacher. Our society generally advises people to focus on what comes easily to them. I think it's also important to focus on learning things we find difficult. So if you can remember these three pieces of advice, <coughs> pursue your passion where there is a need, fail openly and often, and it's never too late to learn something difficult, or even just two out of the three, you will do very well in your career. Congratulations to all of today's graduates. I'm deeply proud to join you in becoming one of the University of Toronto's newest alumni. Thank you.